Okay, hello, good morning. For those of us who are in the Asian time zone, it, today's a truly global event. Um, I'm Dexter, I'm Swarm's uh, CEO. So Swarm's a community of product builders and founders, and we help uh, turn ideas into projects. Uh, and we organize project teams around founder ideas. I am extraordinarily excited for today's event. I think that uh, everyone in the last year has needed to figure out different ways of working. And both Rajiv and Glenn have been really pressing towards these new ways and methods that they were actually piloting before the, the pandemic itself, but have really, their talents and skills have really pushed forward and helped us all cope with how to work across, you know, time zones in two dimensions, synchronously and asynchronously. My job, I only have one today, is to introduce our moderator, and that's Mr. Manya Ayala. I am excited that he's uh, he's uh, <laughs> agreed to moderate today. He's a, a journalist by training, so expect some really interesting questions. Um, Manny has launched and currently runs the Philippine Office of Endeavor, which is a New York-based nonprofit that helps high-impact entrepreneurs scale up their businesses. So I will be quiet for the rest of the talk and kick it back to Manny, who will introduce our speakers. Well, thanks for that intro, Dexter, and welcome to everybody from around the world. And uh, today we're going to tackle the topic, Leading Remote Teams. Now, we all know that remote work is not a new concept, right? And we know this for sure in the Philippines, where way before the pandemic, we had about a million people uh, doing BPO work, right, for customers spread across the world. Now, what the pandemic has done, though, is that it's turned remote work into the default way of working for practically most knowledge workers. Now, even after 20 months of doing this, we are still, you know, we are mere infants, right, in this journey of remote working. We're still very awkward. I know I, for one, I'm still very uncomfortable, um, you know, with, with the way all of this is supposed to work together. And the business leaders that I talk to are always asking, am I doing this the right way, right? How can we be better at this? So we're extremely lucky today that we have two experts who can help us figure out how to navigate this sea change. So we have with us, we have Glenn Fajardo, who has spent a good part of his career focused on the question, how can we be creative together when we're far apart? And uh, you know, recently in 2020, he was Stanford Design Schools or D-Schools Distributed Learning Teaching Fellow where he co-leads the immersive course, Design Across Borders. He's also the co-author of a book called Rituals for Virtual Meetings, Creative Ways to Engage People and Strengthen Relationships. And Glenn's been a practitioner of virtual collaboration for, gosh, over 13 years now, I think. Right, Glenn? That's correct. Um, he specializes in teaching classes and workshops on how to collaborate virtually, such as Design Across Borders and the Reimagining Campus Life series. Um, fun fact. Glenn plays the electric bass and from what he, from what he claims is a really, really good cook. I, I, have yet, <laughs> I have yet to sample this firsthand, but in my next trip to San Francisco, I may just call him out on this. Uh, we also have with us Rajiv Ayangar, who is the CEO and co-founder of Tandem, a white combinator and Andreessen Horowitz backed startup, building the future of remote work, the closest thing to the speed of in-person collaboration. And with Tandem, collaborators can engage with each other in one click, bringing casual conversations and collaborations back to virtual work. Okay, so to kick us off and to quote, um, you know, one of the people whose books I like reading, Simon Sinek, we will start with why, right? With the question why. So maybe I'll start with you first, Glenn, right? So why are you so focused on this issue of remote work? Tell me about your journey in the field of remote work. Yeah, um, th thank you, Manny, and uh, th thanks uh, everyone for, for being here today. Um, I'll start by just saying like, I'm, I'm in a little bit of pain right now, quite frankly, like I, I tore my calf muscle a few, uh, a few hours ago. So if I make any like weird faces, it's not you, it's me. So 
<laughs> but super excited to be here. So I've been working on uh, the uh, problem of virtual collaboration for the last 13 years. And the reason why uh, has really like nothing to do with technology, uh, at least actually uh, marginally. So I uh, work at uh, kind of the intersection of technology and social impact. And I was working with a network of uh, nonprofit technology leaders in 70 countries. And uh, what I found in working with people was we had like really great conversations when we were you know, in person, like once every two years or on kind of field visits. Uh, but there was a huge gap in terms of like the, the, the creative work. And what happened was a lot of the collaboration that was virtual uh, was a lot more uh, kind of transactional and kind of task oriented. And at one point, because of the international aspect of it, I told my boss, you know, we're kind of engaged in accidental colonialism right now, where we are not tapping like the, the greatest like uh, thoughts and creativity of <clears throat> all these really great people like around the world. And so uh, I've been kind of chipping at, away at it um, uh, in various forums and including uh, teaching at the D school, which I've been doing since uh, 2014. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, um, all of a sudden there's a lot more interest in the topic. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but like the main thing is um, how can we tap the creativity and the diversity of thought around the world? And that's really my driving factor and it still is. Okay, cool. Um, Rajiv, I'm, I'm imagining that you got into this because of personal experience, right? With the, the difficulties of working remote. Tell us about your own journey. Yeah, absolutely. My, um, so I have two co-founders and, and we actually started working together to work together. Um, you know, we all built productivity apps at Yahoo and at startups before that. And afterwards, um, you know, it's the best engineer I've ever worked with, best designer I've ever worked with. We, we just wanted to do something together. So we started out um, actually building a, a cryptocurrency company. And, um, you know, we went through a lot of different twists and turns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, around the time we were doing this, both my co-founders had kids. And we went from working in person every single day to working remotely. And, you know, we had all had some experience with remote work. We'd led remote teams in the past. You know, I actually started out my career uh, at Fairchild Semiconductor, you know, working with with uh, people, you know, in Cebu, in Penang, in Suzhou, and um, you know, just we'd had experience before, but experiencing again as a founding group when you're in those early ideation phases, you know, the the, the difference between being able to just brainstorm and have that creative energy in person, and when you're remote and you're not able to connect, you're not able to talk as much, you don't have those aha moments. We just felt that difference so extremely that we started looking at that problem itself. So we turned our gaze inward. We started working on prototypes, trying different tools, putting different tools together uh, and started sharing some of the things we're building with um, you know, other startups that we knew. Uh, and that's how we, we ended up with Tandem. Cool. Oh, by the way, Fairchild uh, has a special place in Endeavor's heart, right? So we talk a lot about the Fairchild mafia, right? As, as really kind of the seminal pay it forward entrepreneurs, right? Who effectively unleashed this massive multiplier effect, right? Because that's really the ethos of Endeavor is, you know, if you're a founder, do well, but also do good by paying it forward. But anyway, I digress. Um, so let's, let's talk about the last 20 months, right? In this field of remote work, you know, how would you characterize what's happened? What are some of the observations, you know, that, that are worth noting? What, what was surprising, you know, were there, was there anything terrible that happened in the last 20 months? Was there anything you know, really cool that happened in the last 20 months? I'd love to hear your experiences. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Glad you want to, you want to go first? Oh, no, no, go, go ahead, Rajiv, please. Sure. Well, I mean, there's a ton because we've been, we started building a tandem maybe, I don't know, six, six months before the pandemic. So a lot of, what we've built has been led by the pandemic. So most of what I've learned and the team has learned is right there in, in the product and how we help you, you know, tap, tap your teammates on the shoulder. But I'd say one, one kind of way I see the pandemic is kind of in three phases of, of remote work. You know, phase remote 1.0, before the pandemic, we had companies, uh, we knew it was possible, right? We had companies like GitLab and Zapier and Automatic that kind of paved the way for remote work and wrote handbooks and had a particular way of working. And the, the interesting thing there was they kind of, they really went away from synchronous communication, from actually talking in real time. 
in favor of more asynchronous, more documentation, uh, more chat, more organized chat. And, you know, I, because the people didn't have Zoom, video calls weren't, weren't ready. And it, it really was a required shift. And once you shift your culture to very asynchronous, these early companies got a lot of power, right? They, they got a lot of transparency. Remote 2.0 during the pandemic, I think the, the world is not ready to stop talking to each other overnight. And so for us working on a very synchronous tool, it was very validating to see people trying to bridge that gap, mm -hmm. looking for new ways. You know, the, the, the happy hours that we all kind of grew wary of, there, there is still is something great about having that intentional space to connect with your teammates. And, and you know, through experimentation, we found better, and way, better ways of doing that. So people kept talking with each other. Video calls were better. You know, Zoom it was a lot better than the previous generation of tools. Tools like, like ours, like Tandem, you know, our engineers cut their teeth at FaceTime and Discord and Skype and Twilio. So this generation of video tools is just better than the last generation. So that was cool to see. And the other thing with Remote 2.0 was mass adoption of multiplayer tools like, like Figma, like Notion, Google Docs, mm -hmm. Google Sheets, right? These things that allow for distributed work. Remote 3.0, which I want to, is, is a really interesting phase that's coming up, which is really hybrid work. And that's where, uh, you know, I think we've always seen the world going. It's, it's, it's going to be some mix of the two. And it presents some challenges that are maybe more difficult than either uh, you know, fully in person or fully remote. Yeah. Well, if you were to, if you were to talk to, um, you know, your colleagues, your, your customers, would you say, would they say that on balance, they, they became more productive or less productive, more fulfilled or less fulfilled, <laughs> more human or less human? I mean, on balance, the last, think... last 20 months, I mean, are people feeling better, neutral or worse about how they work? You know, I, I think there's some very, very positive things that have come out, but there are also some really difficult things that, that don't have an easy solution. And I think there are different ways of slicing it, but I think one, one kind of underlying law of human interaction is how quickly trust builds in different media. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there was a study from the University of Michigan being there versus seeing there where um, they, they characterize how quickly does trust build in a group you know, in in person, video, voice, and chat, and voice and video eventually get to the same level as in person trust, but hmm. it takes quite a bit longer. And then chat, just text chat, never gets to that same level. So if you imagine this at an organizational scale, at a societal scale, uh, you know, you start to notice things like it's much easier to work with colleagues that you knew before the pandemic. You already have that relationship; it's easier to maintain it. It's much more difficult for new teammates to feel like they're part of the team. We saw the mass resignation, right? You know, after uh, you know, people kind of hit their one year and, and they, they don't feel as much connection to their teammates as they did before. On the other hand, you have less interruption, you have more focus time, you have, uh, it's easier to get um, kind of independence and work-life balance. So there's some really positive things that came out of it, but at the organizational level, when you talk about creativity, when you talk about like team cohesion, there, there are a lot of things that we're still really struggling to figure out as a society. You know, I have um, three young staff members at Endeavor who I hired um, earlier this year. So I hired them never having met them in person. And, you know, they're, they're all really, you know, amazing people. And so we got a lot of work done, you know, using the tools you described. But I tell you, we've had two in-person meetings in the last, what, 45 days. And those were almost, I would say, tearful moments. I mean, you should have seen the joy <laughs> in the faces of it's these. intense, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. having worked with each other for what, 60, almost a half a year, right? It was almost like, you know, a baby was born. <laughs> it was amazing. Anyway, Glenn, what about you? Because you deal with yeah, a lot Glenn. of students, right? And I, I can imagine that, you know, this was a completely different universe they were thrust into. What, what are some of your experiences dealing yeah. with it, it, I, I think it, it's it's important to, um, in, Rajiv, you're kind of uh, hinting at this, I think, to kind of decouple the pandemic from remote work, because I think those two have been so like um, intermixed and, uh, you know, that, that's what the reality is. But um, <clears throat> I think the things that were surprising for me were, there were a lot of things that I've done over, um, you know, the course of my explorations and virtual collaboration that I didn't realize I was doing until the pandemic where people were like, 
you know, X is terrible, Y is terrible, Z is terrible. It's like, really? Like, oh. And I would go, <clears throat> I would sit in on their meetings and I'd be like, oh yeah, it is terrible. Like, it is like really bad, like how there's no connection. And I just assumed that everybody would adapt to it to the level of um, what, what my students and other collaborators have been doing. Um, I think that uh, what was surprising was things like Zoom fatigue. I didn't really have a handle on how that would uh, play out. Mm. And um, things like, I would always like look at the camera when I talk. And then because I look at the camera, I'm not staring at people's faces so much. And because I'm not staring at people's faces, I don't get that oversampling that you get from overreading somebody's face. And then I realized like, oh, this is what, mm. if, if you look at like the way people look on Zoom calls, like, like Dexter's eyes right now, like you can see like where he's looking at probably my face, but his eyes are going like this direction. And then he's looking at me and there's like a, a 150 second uh, uh, delay, which kind of throws off the synchrony of the moment. So uh, you're kind of like over reading plus there's a slight delay. And then that creates like this fatigue that I had not had a good handle on before because I I've just been trained to look at a camera over doing like other kinds of work. And then there's all these nuances that came out where like, oh, I didn't notice this. I didn't notice that. I didn't notice that, you know, the way that we greet each other in a call, like that, that's just something that, you know, me and my students did. And then now I'm like, oh, not everybody does that. And then like not establishing that moment of human connection, not establishing that safety, like all these things that were previously kind of invisible or second nature for me, uh, all of a sudden became a lot more conscious and uh, visible. You talk about you know, that. that's... Oh, go ahead, Virgie, go ahead. Oh yeah, I there, just an interesting chart that I saw kind of piggybacking on this. So um, we start, like we stopped talking a lot as a society during the pandemic. There's a chart on WebRTC usage. So WebRTC is the protocol that does most of video calls. You know, our platform's built on it. Google Meet's built on it. That's probably the biggest one most people know about. Zoom isn't, but WebRTC is still a big part of the internet's video calling. And there's a chart from WebRTC on how during the pandemic, the hours of WebRTC calls went up 100x. And so you get an idea of what it looks like for an in-person conversation to move online. Then this is the scary part that they, they didn't call out. Over the next you know, nine to 12 months, that number fell to a third. And it's, you know, it's not all people talking in person because we're still very remote during this phase of the pandemic. People just, to a large degree, stop talking because it is mm -hmm. hard, it is awkward, there is this fatigue. And so you know, to some degree, that's, that's you know, what, what a lot of tools are, are, are solving. But as a, at a societal level, we really did stop talking as much. Yeah, and to, and to build on that, Rajiv, like I think uh, to piggyback on that, there's a, there's a study, I think it was a Microsoft study like in October 2020, where they were looking at patterns of communication. And uh, two of the big findings of that were like people within teams talk to each other a lot, like during the pandemic. Yeah. Like it, it actually, that level of communication actually went up or held steady. But the amount of conversations between teams went way down. And so what, what, there was this interesting kind of almost like bunkering kind of uh, phenomenon like during the pandemic. And uh, one of the things that I'm really excited to learn uh, uh, more about from Rajiv's work is like, how do you uh, foster more kind of um, less directed conversation and more kind of across and that kind of passive, that kind of noticing and what Rajiv calls presence, um, I think is, is a really interesting frontier of like the next, uh, the, the next phase of remote work. I think one of the interesting things, uh, Glenn, that, that I heard in one of your talks, right, is acknowledging what is for us in, intrinsically um, unnatural. Like yeah. looking at a Zoom screen without really moving your head position for two hours is extremely unnatural, right? So you, you talk about this concept of uh, why do some things result in screen fatigue, others uh, screen intrigue, right? And I, I remember you had, uh, you know, a little... Uh, sort of discussion on that scene in the matrix right neo picking the red pill and the blue pill and how many cuts that took maybe, maybe you can share that with the audience right because i, yeah. I thought it's, that was a very interesting insight yeah so there um um many of you might have seen the movie the matrix and there's this famous scene between like um where neo is choosing between the red pill and the, and the blue pill and so i show that clip and it's a 65 second clip that i show and in that 65 seconds, I asked people how many cuts are in that clip and like how many shifts of camera view are there. 
<clears throat> most people will guess like in the range of uh, maybe like about like, I don't know, like eight to 10. And th again, this is over 65 seconds. And the actual answer is 19. There are 19 cuts in 65 seconds. And that's how often like our eyes like naturally kind of shift around. And so what happens with Zoom calls is we get um, kind of locked into like a single view. And if you think about it, like you're also staring at a very small space. Like there's so much about like the design of laptops that affects like how we interact with each other because the screen's a certain size, uh, like that's kind of the world that you've been stuck in. And then the keyboard is a certain size, like your hands are also stuck in like a very like constrained space. And then the proportion of like where the camera is to where you're sitting is fixed. And so we're, we've kind of created this world where we are like kind of locked into a certain place. So um, there are so many things that we can learn from movies, uh, like where like it shifts the view because it really movies mirror the way that we look at the world. That's, that's why they, and there's a lot of work on like uh, why this is the case, uh, per particularly by Jeff Sachs. Um, but I think there's also things to be learned about like how um, starting to like see the laptop. I know this sounds like a weird thing to say, but like we take the laptop for granted in terms of like how we interact with it, but it actually like affixes our interactions in a very like defined space. And I think that's gonna be part of the next frontier of remote work is to start questioning some of these assumptions uh, uh, on, a, on a, like a hardware level and also like on a, just a person level, if that makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a quote that, that came from you, or you might have been quoting somebody else. I thought it was pretty cool. It was about how we naturally adapt to new technologies, right? It goes like this. Humans are made for technological change. Our bodies and brains are designed to incorporate new tools into our activities as if they were extensions of our bodies. Yeah. About that a little bit. Yeah. So the, the example I use for this is um, when you pick up the phone, when you pick up the phone, like you, you'll be like, hello, right? And you say hello. And when the phone was invented, um, hello did not mean hello. So um, <clears throat> hello at the time meant like, hello, what do we have here? Like that's, that's, that, that's the, the, the older meaning of hello. And so Edison and Alexander Graham Bell had this thing where they said, okay, when somebody answers the phone, there has to be something that kind of breaks the silence, right? And so they had to create like this what do you do when that happens? And then um, Edison said, oh, what we should do is the person who answers it says something and that something should be hello. And then Alexander Graham Bell said, okay, I like the idea of somebody like the, the person picking it up, uh, answering it, but they shouldn't say hello. They should say ahoy. Like, cause like it was kind of like, it's from like from uh, naval ships. So what's we were- wrong, What's wrong with that? I say ahoy all the time. You, right. you can, you actually, you totally, you totally should Manny. Like, and so it, it like that, just the act of saying hello, when you pick up and you answer the phone is an invented thing. There's okay. nothing, there's nothing natural about that. That's, that, that that's, is, that's, a, that's what you call a ritual. Um, it, yeah, that's, that's an example of a, of, of, a, of a ritual, but it's, it's like, I think the, the broader point is even the norms around how people use technology are invented. It's not just about like the device itself, or uh, for that matter, if you think about the telephone, the telephone was invented in 1876. It didn't really become commonly used in business until 1950s, the 50s or so. And so there, uh, I think sometimes we kind of get too affixated to the technology itself and not the technology within the, <clears throat> the, the entire like social context in which it operates. And that we have to invent not just the technology, but also the social, social norms around it. Okay, before before we shift, yeah. you, and I'm going to I'm going to ask Rajiv about about tandem. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, get get a little bit of uh, insight into your chapter three in your book, the secret science of virtual meetings. Maybe maybe share some of the highlights from that particular chapter, since I'm yeah. sure a lot of the people in this uh, in, in the audience would be curious about that. Yeah, I think I think um, there are um, a bunch of different things, but like um, I'll kind of. Uh, double click on the movie stuff. Um, if we think about the science of movies, and we, we talked about cuts a little bit, how they mirror like how we shift the, the way that we uh, view things. Uh, there's also this concept of chunking in movies where we will, um, we don't have to see like an entire like uh, continuous run of like everything that a character saw. We'll see like, you know, this bit, this bit, and this bit. 
And the reason why that works is that um, our brains uh, put together things into, into pieces. <clears throat> They're called like event models by cognitive scientists. And so um, sometimes we think that we have to have like the whole continuous run of everything, but really what we need to do is create like chunked experiences that allow people to like ingest them in ways that our brain actually works. Um, I don't know if that totally makes sense, but like uh, think about like movies and like how they do a scene change and they have like a wide shot that tells you like you're in a new place, then it has like these establishing shots, uh, et cetera. Or if you think about like a book, a book has like chapters, you know, like chapters show like there's a beginning and end. And so you need these kind of markers of, of like beginnings and ends of sections that allow people to kind of break things up. Otherwise it just feels like this big, I mean, I'm sure you've all been in meetings. I just feel like it's big, like massive goo, you know, that's just like kind of like there, but like you need to kind of break it up into, into pieces and then create like markers for those pieces. So people are able to hone in on that. Okay, cool. So Rajiv, I'm going to ask you um, what you what you guys are doing in tandem, you know, what, what the big idea is. And we are getting quite a number of questions, you know, in the, uh, in the chat here around, well, how do you lead teams better, right? If they're remote, how do you build trust? How do you build culture? How do you collaborate? So I'll, I'll throw all of those questions to you in one go. Um, take it away. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do a really quick kind of overview because you know you can you can download and try tandem you know it's free for teams under 10 and we have a 30-day free trial at tandem.chat but tandem is a virtual office for remote teams and distributed teams it takes the form of a desktop app where you can see a list of teammates and you get this rich sense of presence you see what they're up to you kind of see if they're in work mode or not and you can talk in one click so you know a lot of what glenn was talking about about uh, you know, what are the new social norms of the virtual office that's something that we have just just love digging into and going deeper and deeper. So things like wave, that was one of the first things we added where you can just wave at somebody, send them a little notification, they can wave back, they can chat, you can talk. Uh, we got a high five, you know, so when you're, when you have those celebratory moments, you can high five somebody else in the call. Uh, and, and, and you can also, you know, fake somebody out or steal the high five. So there are these kind of celebrations that are, that are so important. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of other stuff, but it's just, you know, we're focused around how you talk with your teammates. And I'd say like thinking about serendipity and seeing some of the questions coming in on how do you build serendipity? One thing that, that we found, you know, there's a lot of experimentation that's necessary, but one thing that we've always found works is increased presence and reduce friction. You know, if you increase the awareness of who's around, if you increase how much your teammates know that you're around and you reduce the friction to talking, you'll see people just naturally talk. Like people want to talk to each other. If you put them in a room, they'll talk. Yeah. And what's a room, but making it really easy to talk and, and increasing presence. You know, I, um, I, I recall a conversation you had on YouTube somewhere where you described uh, three scenarios, right? All different, um, I guess, in, in inter, interaction frameworks. And one is, uh, how do you recover the water cooler chatter? What the other one, the other scenario was silent co-working, and the other one was brainstorming. Right? I mean, these are all extremely you know, sort of different objectives. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, they, and these are three of many. Like, there's so many different ways that like to work with each other. Each team's different. Each team's different depending on different what phase they're in. You know, if you're in an office, you can get my attention in so many different ways. You know. You, you, know, you can tap me on the shoulder, you can wave at me, you can talk with somebody else and pull me in as a third person. Uh, you know, we can talk as we're in the hallway going to or from a meeting. Uh, you can put a post-it on my desk and say, hey, can we talk you know, when you're free? There's so many different ways to interact. Uh, and then the, I think the challenge is that when you're remote, you know, before things like virtual offices, there's only one way to interact, which is a conference call where you generate an ID, you create a calendar event or you message somebody that, and then you, you know, load up this thing, you know, it takes a while, it takes a minute or more. And so that really constrains the types of conversations you can have, you know, both in the format, we're staring at each other. It's very oppositional. It's not as collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, and also just the friction that it takes to pull this up means, you know, it feels more formal. The more friction there is to start a conversation that sets this kind of minimum bar of formality to the conversation, for the extreme example is, you know, if I send you an email and we book a calendar event for four weeks out, we're not going to talk for five minutes. Mm. You know, we're going to have, we're going to 
actually, you know, get a whole bunch of, we're going to have to be intentional about that time. And in the process, we may lose some casual, less important, but, you know, personal conversation. Whereas if I just run into you on the street, you know, you might just talk about what's on your mind right now. It may not be the most important thing in the world, but I, I get to know you better as a person. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of what we do is recovering that. So half of our calls are under 15 minutes. They're these quick, spontaneous calls that you don't have to schedule. Um, yeah. So let's talk about trust, right? You, talk, you talked about trust earlier on. I, this is really addressed to both of you. Um, and I've seen a couple of questions on the chat around trust. How, well, how do you build that trust? What's the best way to build that trust? And, and you and know, it's the, the, particularly um, relevant for new hires, right? That haven't yet tasted the culture, have, haven't yet built those relationships. I mean, if we're going to be like, yes, it, how do you build it? Yeah, there, there are a lot of, difficult answers there, but I think maybe one, one thing I'd step back on is very practically, if you're building a company and you have the ability to meet in person some of the time, it's such an incredibly, incredible accelerant to building trust that I would just do that. Like try to meet in person when you can. And then secondarily, like working on hard problems together is such a way to bring people together. So, you know, you can build you can try to build trust by getting lots of FaceTime. You can have all of the, the mixers and one-on-ones and push people to do one-on-ones and you should, but there isn't anything that's as much a substitute for working towards a common goal. And one of the things that was a big inspiration for us when we started building Tandem was from the gaming world, seeing how people, you know, especially young people all over the world are on Discord, talking with friends they've never met, becoming lifelong friends, playing multiplayer games. And there's a really strong analogy with work. Like when you work on something together, you really get to know somebody in a way that you don't as quickly if you're just talking at a surface level. Is it Glenn, you want to add anything to that? You know, just on the issue of building trust. Yeah, I would, I would echo a lot of what, what you've said. And I, I'd say like, you need to have something for people to do together. Like that, that is like, an preferably something that has like, a, uh, like some level of difficulty like it has to be something that's like non-trivial and then like that struggle will will build a lot of connection and i'd also start with something that is not like too too consequential uh like you don't want to put like the fate of the company into to you know and have two strangers kind of uh try to figure it out on the spot but a lot of times it start with like we do these little like uh a lot of games at the d school and then people think like oh it's just like about having fun but it's really to rajiv's point about like how they're engaging in a joint challenge and having a shared experience. And then like, and then you, and then when you have a joint challenge with a shared experience, you have something to talk about later. And then that thing to talk about ends up leading to other things that, that, that people talk about. Uh, the problem is we, we set up these situations where it's kind of like, um, instead of asking people uh, to, you know, usually we, we like meet for coffee or meet over a beer. Like there's some kind of like pretense for, 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 for interaction. But like a lot of video calls feel like, hey, let's meet at the sidewalk and talk at the sidewalk. There's not like a thing to do, right? There's not like, and that thing to do provides kind of the grease for interaction, those early mm -hmm. interactions. And then when you have those early interactions, you start talking. And then once you start talking about one thing that leads to like another thing. And that's, I think, where the, the seeds of trust are sown. But can you develop- Yeah, I think, and that's why- can, can you develop that deep trust if it's purely virtual though? Because I, have, I do have a question here, right? How do you build a great culture in a remote first culture? Game nights are all great, but doesn't feel the same as a tight knit team as I had in person. Yeah, so, so th that, that's a great question, Manny. Like, I think the, the games are just a scaffold to getting to like the, the deeper work. So like once you start to build the, those challenges and then have them engage in more like substantive or consequential things after that, uh, that is uh, where I've been, I've helped build like, uh, you know, teams, where um, people had those cheerful moments, like, and they never met each other. Like they, they, like, because they had this thing that was all important to them, it started with a few games, but then it started with things that were really important and really mattered to everyone. Uh, so the games are really just a scaffold to getting to the real work. Mm -hmm. Regina, yeah, on, on that question, that, I, I think that's a great question. How do you build culture in a remote first team? Uh, I, I'd say the, experiment you know there there are lots of things to try and every team is a little bit different so some of the things that we we tried because we're you know, we talked to all sorts of different companies doing different things um the, the one thing that is universal is if you can get in-person time you know once a year once a quarter once a semester that's universal 
But then other things we tried, um, you know, we did various games. We, we had fun with some of them, but they never really took, you know, there are many possible reasons for that. We don't have as many gamers at the company, but they never took as much. What really uh, got people jazzed was doing a hackathon and people had a lot of fun. Like they, they did some crazy things that, you know, we can't, we probably can never release, but they had a ton of fun and they worked together. And so that ended up being much better for our team. We also did uh, like a virtual coffee tasting and a virtual wine tasting, which was cool. And for us, like the coffee roaster and the winemaker were both very closely connected to our team, like significant others or people on the team. So that was kind of nice and personal. Um, let's see what else. And yeah, working on hard things together is always, always great. Like the, that, that um, you know, Glenn, to your point of not having anything to do, th this is, I think, when we first launched Tandem, the default video, and it still is, is to have your video off and to the right. So you're working on a Google Doc or Figma, and your video is small by default, kind of like peripheral vision. Mm. And initially, our thesis was like, uh, it, 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 we, it's like peripheral vision. We, did, we wanted the video not to be distracting. We wanted the work to be the focus. But as we got a lot of feedback that people liked this mode, and we started to ask, like, well, what, what is nice about it? Why does it feel you know, more comfortable in some ways. I think it is about that. Uh, there is the thing in the center to do together. You're doing something together. Mm. You are not interrogating each other across from a table, you right. know, and, and I think finding lighter ways to connect is another thing you could try. So try audio only try walking one-on-ones where you get on, you know, get on a mobile app or get on your phone and, you know, go out for a walk. Um, yeah. Hey, so, so Glenn, so how, how can remote work or how we think about remote work benefit from design thinking? Yeah, I, th I think it's a lot of what Rajiv just described, which is like, it, it's, it's this process of experimentation and then a lot of like noticing. So for, for example, like um, uh, one, one exercise that I do with my students is uh, a lot of my students will say like, okay, what, what we need to do is we need to leverage uh, the status function like in, in chat. And so when people know that they're, you know, available, busy or, or whatnot. And so, um, and I, I know Rajiv knows like a ton, a ton about this, this particular thing, but like, I, we'll just say, okay, let's, let's try it and see like what happens like with, with the use of busy, you know, free kind of status. And then like what design thinking does is it trains you to like, uh, not just kind of take things at face value, but rather like watch what are the actual behaviors or something and then start to interrogate like why it is and talk to people like uh, like afterwards after observing them kind of seeing what happens and then the patterns that you see are like oh, okay well it, it turns out like uh, people don't really like change their status like there are a few people diehards about it but like generally speaking it's not like a kind of system that it requires too much effort or it requires like uh, for some people it's um they feel like, oh, I should show that I'm available because that's like the social norm. And like, I want to look like I'm, you know, working at 11 p.m., even though you may or may not be working at 11 p.m. Uh, but th the way you find that out is to observe and then also like ask people about it afterwards. And then you, when you start to notice like these things, you, you notice these, uh, these other kind of unmet needs that are within that, that context. And then you start experimenting and trying different things and then seeing how they work in practice and that, that process of uh, like really honing in on understanding the needs and the problems, and then uh, thinking about like a lot of different solution paths and then making those solution paths tangible quickly so that you can try them quickly and then get behavioral feedback and then start to iterate from there. Uh, that's one example of how uh, design thinking can, <clears throat> can contribute. Okay, and you know, that's a great problem. point. Like, um, oh yeah, sorry. I was just no, 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 no. point because, because um, you know, where we are with remote work, the pandemic has made a lot, has made the world in general much more familiar with video communications. But it's still by, you know, far from a, um, you know, a, a, you know, widely adopted comfortable tool. I was uh, reading Crossing the Chasm, uh, the kind of famous book on you know, tech marketing, uh, yeah. just a couple of months ago. And the two examples that they chose at the beginning of the book, this is 30 years ago for technologies that are very far, that have been around for a while, but are very far from crossing the chasm to mainstream adoption. Does anybody remember what they were? It was, it was um, neural nets and desktop video chat. Huh. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, when was that? So when fast was that? forward 30 years. 30 oh, years like ago. 30 years ago, they thought these were the amazing new technologies, but they're a, they're a little bit of ways from catching on. And they were very right. It took a pandemic to make video wide stream. It took tons of innovation for neural nets to go out of fashion and come back in and become dominant. Anyway, they, these it takes a long time for like, and because we're not in that end phase where everybody's comfortable for video chat, what it means is, you, you, you should experiment. You should think about it as a design challenge. You should think about your team as having unique needs, not looking for the best practices generally, like no. take those as inputs, but then curate what works with your team. Yeah, and, and that, that, that specificity, Rajiv, I think is so important. Like, like what you mentioned about like um, games with your team, like there are, there, it's, it's not just sort of games as a category, but it's, it has to be these, you have, you have to experiment to find the specificities of like what works with your team. And like, you can't, um, there's no one thing that works for everyone. So like uh, create a portfolio of experiments of what you're trying, right? And then also notice what happens in each one. And like, what's the piece that's like hitting, like instead of saying, did it work or not work? What's the piece of it that worked? What's the piece of it that didn't work? What was the surprising feeling from them? That cycle of experimentation and, and curiosity, I think, um, one of my proudest achievements during the pandemic is I got my family into experimenting. And then so now like my five-year-old niece will appear like in, they're like, okay, we're going to do the feature chairs. So like when you talk to the family, like, you know, most of the family's like in the background and then there's like the feature speakers. So like, that's the person that you're talking to. I was like, oh, that's awesome. That you guys are experimenting and like, yeah, dude, that does kind of work. It's interesting. Well, the exact same thing almost happened to us right, in our family here. So we have uh, we have two siblings living in the U.S. We have I uh, have two siblings here. My mom's here. My mom's 84. And basically, and we had never done this before, uh, we now have four scheduled Zoom calls a week with my mom on her iPad, right? Oh, wow. And so but to your point, right? We adapt, you know, this is all adaptive. We adapt to the technologies that are introduced us. So I want to spend the remaining time we have actually doing a bit of um, let's say future gazing, right? You know, where is this all gonna end up? And and let me just um, point to an interview I saw. Uh, this is such an Adela of Microsoft being asked about the future of work. And he says, Well, there are two mega trends. Uh, first mega trend when he talks about is the great resignation or as the CEO of LinkedIn calls it, the great reshuffling, which largely came about because we had a lot of time in our hands and we began to reevaluate why we're working, where we're working, right? why we're doing what we're doing. But the other one, which is more germane to this discussion, you know, he, talk, he calls it, the, you know, sort of the hybrid megatrend where we've sort of reconfigured the where, the what, and the how we work, right? Um, knowing what you know, doing what you're doing, where do you think we're heading, right? We're coming out of this, you know, uh, cases are going down, uh, the, who knows what Omicron is gonna do, but you know, it seems that the world is you know, uh, gearing up for back to normal, quote unquote. Are we gonna go back to normal or have things irreversibly changed? Well, I think depending on how you look at it, it could be both, right? Like. We're, I think hybrid is absolutely going to be the future for a few very simple reasons. You know, building trust in person is much faster than building it remotely. And in an organization, trust is speed. It's that simple. So a lot of organizations are going to be hybrid in some way, shape, or form. And we're seeing that across the board. You know, Google, uh, Apple. Um, I think there was an Andreessen portfolio survey where two thirds were going hybrid and one quarter we're going remote first. And most remote first companies have plans to go to an office in some way, shape or form. So it's just, it's just going to be the norm. And it means, means very different things to different people. There's the flexibility problem where you, some people want to be much more flexible, but then it, it helps from a capacity planning standpoint to be more coordinated. There's the, the kind of the second class citizen problem where when you're remote, you're super underpowered. You, know, you can't participate in the office as much. So you know, there, there are going to be these, these really difficult problems that we'll need to confront and adapt to, and the workplace is going to need to evolve a ton to, you know, to accommodate this. Um, but I, I think it's, um, you know, it's not, yeah, it, it's just how the world's gonna be. And the reason I said it's both to your question is that to some degree, every company at some scale has been hybrid forever. Like mm -hmm. the, the conference call, was developed for companies that are sp spread across different campuses, different cities, different countries. 
so hybrid work is absolutely nothing new, but but now it's not just a fun, it's not just something you run into with scale. It's something you confront even in your founding team. Mm -hmm. So Glenn, you, you talked about, you know, an emerging world where it's going to be forward, hybrid and integrated. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I think, well, I think, I actually think that the word hybrid will be like a weird antiquated word in 10 years. Yeah. I, I think it'll just be like, that's what they're like, oh, right. That was when people back in the time where people thought like everything had to be in person. And mm -hmm. we'll, and I think, I think in person, in person interactions certainly are, are not going anywhere. I think that that's going to, that's going to continue to be a thing, but I think it is, um, there's this interesting kind of psychology of that's going on with people coming back to offices where there is this, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't have like, I need to research this more thoroughly, but just anecdotally from what I've observed and what I've uh, uh, talked to friends about is there's this initial kind of euphoria where people are like, Oh my God, it's great to see you and stuff like that. And then there's this, after like several weeks, they're like, Oh wait, like this is like, there's some things that are cool, but I actually miss certain things. And then I've had uh, some instructors uh, and uh, uh, colleagues in academia, like at, at Stanford have, who, who tell me like, it's like, Glenn, I don't want to admit this, but there are certain things that I really miss about like, you know, like online <laughs> learning and like, and then, so I think we're getting all, when you say normal, um, I think, um, let me try to tease that apart a little bit. I think there's something like, I think we'll, uh, we'll reach normalcy in the sense that it will, uh, uh, we'll, we'll reach this level of comfort and this thing that it kind of feels right as we experiment and figure it out, but it's not gonna be the same thing as what it was in 2019. So if, if you confuse like the way it was before as normal, then no, we're not going back to normal. But if you want normal as in it feels right, I think we're gonna get there pretty soon. Okay, so we have about four minutes left. I'm going to ask one question and then I have three questions from the audience. So, you know, just my, my final question, right, really sort of dreaming way into the future. You know, how do you look at these trends like Web 3.0, you know, the idea of a metaverse? Are those, are those ideas worth looking at in the context of remote work? I think they're very... Uh, kind of analogous or they're very parallel, right? Like <clears throat> one of the reasons remote work and distributed teams was so on our mind is that the last product we built was for cryptocurrency trading firms. Mm -hmm. And so all of these teams are distributed. All of the projects are distributed. It's distributed yeah. by default. Yeah. And so that, that, that model in some way, the, the way people work on web three is a little bit of a peek into the future. Yeah. Yeah. So. Glenn, any comments on that? Um, yeah, I think I think there's going to be like a change in like the a lot of the interfaces in which we we interact with the world. Um, I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think the future is like heavy Oculus headsets on your face. Like I think I think that is uh, kind of too too narrow of a conception of like what um, you know even like what the what the what the metaverse is. Uh, but I think there are things where. Um, like if you if you look at um, the cognitive science of screen size, I, I know this, this is a totally random topic, but like um, there's a big difference between interacting with something where you have to like scroll and zoom, and all of those like little pieces of friction like add a cognitive load, even you but you don't think it's not a big deal versus when you're looking at a big screen and you turn your head, that's a yeah. completely different experience. And so <clears throat> part of what I think is that the metaverse, the way people think about it right now. They have kind of the right um, kind of idea that there's going to be a change, but um, <clears throat> sorry, this the, the meds are really kicking the, in. The format is too literal, right? Like a lot for a lot exactly. of people, they're thinking about too little. Yeah, I, we could, I feel like we could talk about this forever, and and that's a that's a lot of what has been so successful about Tandem, like focusing on the the root need, but not delivering it in maybe the most obvious way, searching for the best way, yeah. and that's also. You know, we as we think about hybrid work, we have, I, I don't want to share too much, but we have a pretty big, uh, you know, extension of tandem for the physical office. And mm -hmm. what you were talking about, about large screens being less cognitive load to interact with people, like that's a big part of it. Yeah. Like if, if you look, if you look at a company like Tanari in Japan, like I was thinking about Tanari. Some, yeah. Super Starline project in Google. Yeah. Super trippy work where it's like a lot of it is like, 
like, man, how are they going to do that? But it's so awesome that that's, that's how they're conceiving of the challenge. But, uh, but a lot of the stuff that they describe, like just, uh, it defies physics when I'm like, like you, you cannot have like difficult. Um, <clears throat> when they say you can't go have, have things that don't have like delay. Um, yeah. If you yeah. look at, yeah. at like the physics of a single just traveling across life. the world. Yeah. The limit. Yeah. Well, certainly but, and, uh, but, but just if, you look, if you look at Tenari, Tenari's like website, yeah. you'll get like a very different kind of view on like what the future can look like. And I have no idea whether they're cool. or not succeed, but it's like super inspiring to look at. Well, certainly a lot yeah, to be excited about in the future. Um, we do have three questions here. So let's bring it back to the real world. Let me, let me just ask these three questions. First one here, how can you be there for people on a remote team? Example, if somebody's sick, in person, you can visit the hospital or bring balloons and flowers. How can you be there, right? That's a great questions. That's a great question. And it's really, it's tough. That, that is one of the things that is, is, you know, you know, remote work is maybe, a, a, it, it, it makes it more difficult for sure. You know, you can send, you can send gifts, you can talk to them, you can maybe express, you know, your, how you, how you feel about it, your support, but you are a little bit more limited in what you can do. Yeah you're more limited in what you can do. And in some ways you're extended in what you can do. So I've had friends who've gotten sick and um, they're in like a different country than I'm, I'm at. And before I wouldn't have thought like, oh, I should, <clears throat> I should do like a video call. And then sometimes I'll do, I'll do like a video call and I'll take my friend for a walk when they're stuck in a bed. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Here's the next question, right? This, this one's a pretty interesting question. The boundaries between managers and frontliners have blurred for us and have become a double-edged sword. Yeah. More informality has eroded the chain of command, perhaps. Thoughts? <laughs> I tend to think it's net, I tend to think it's net positive, even if it's uncomfortable in a transitionary phase, because I think, you know, the the thing that makes an organization tick is is not a chain of command necessarily, but alignment and relationships. Uh, there was another question I saw that I think is connected to this, which is how do you build accountability and mm -hmm. how do you promote accountability within remote teams, encourage people in there to deliver on their commitments? Uh, for frameworks, you know, they, I don't think there's anything that unique to remote work, but these things become a lot more challenging to to do well when you're when you're remote. Um, you know, for us, we we do a very lightweight version of an OKR uh, kind of goal setting exercise at the company level, not at the individual level. It's pretty lightweight. You know, we we don't share the goals externally. It's just a way for us to, uh, you know, create the create the game, create the scoring system that we're playing. Awesome. Um, so I do believe we are out of time. Um, I'm being nudged to uh, bring this to an end. So. I guess I'd like to thank Glenn and Rajiv for spending this morning, well, your evening with us today and for uh, all, the, all the really deep insights. I'd, I'd have to say, you know, some, some really cool, somewhat nerdy insights, you know, which, which, which I love. Um, we're gonna see this unfold before our very eyes, you know, and Glenn and Rajiv are gonna be in the thick of things. So thank you gentlemen both for uh, your contribution to swarming with us. And with that, I'll pass the floor back to Dexter. Thank you both so much, Rajiv, uh, Glenn. You know, um, I actually met one of the panelists when I was 17 years old. I won't say which one, uh, but I learned how to facilitate uh, from, from, okay, I'll just say Glenn. And there's two, two critical things that I think that has uh, transcended uh, work mode and work, um, you know, the, the, the tools that we use which is the first is to listen actively, right? And to be, to demonstrate that you're listening and to make other people feel heard. And the second thing that I learned was learning how to probe and to inquire. And I think that while the format, the, the dimensionality has changed over time, you know, going from synchronous to asynchronous, literally three dimensions to two dimensions. I think a large part of how we've built trust or how I've built trust in organizations that I've led is by 
showing people that they're heard and by asking probing questions. And it's kind of the foundation for me to collaborate, to build trust, and then also to direct attention towards a common vision. The, the world has seen its challenges. And I think that one of the really important things that I, or, or kind of the foundations of my relationship to Rajiv, Glenn, and Manny, is the fact that there's intentionality to want to enable connections and relationships. Um, Rajiv is probably the person who I just meet, met the most recently, but the context in which we met was how do we enable people that we care about in common to succeed, to tell their stories. I think one of the amazing takeaways from today is that this notion of building trust is when extended out to communities, a really powerful thing. We share what we're learning individually because as you'll say, even though Rajiv has built a company and Glenn has written a book, the common piece of wisdom that they, they shared is that what you do in your own context matters most. What you do to observe, learn, and test things with people who are around you is more important than what's in their book and, what, and what's in their product. And I think that this is the thing that we wanna to do together. So we wanna to learn together and create modes of learning and challenging and interrogating. And I love the fact that we're asking each other questions, even though we're, we're cutting it across time zones. Most of the people who are participating in this call are going to be doing so afterward. There's like nearly like 200 people who signed up because they wanted the video from today. And I think this is, you know, both of you, I think this is, we've barely scratched the surface on observing and establishing best practices, but this is what I'm really looking forward to is continuing this conversation. So I think we have, you know, I'm just completely inspired by the, the level of thought and how both of you have, and even you, Manny, yeah, I have to always throw in Manny, are building the framework for us to build, work better together, creating the, the rails to experiment, to enable others to do great work together. Um, and you know, on that note, I'd like to just tie up. Uh, I'll kick it now to Pauline, who has a few kind of housekeeping items. And thank you all for joining. I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation.